Hey, welcome to uh, the Thursday edition of my Every Other Week uh, webcast, talking about travel with a guest. Today, my guest is a name I'm sure you'll recognize. He's an actor, director, and a writer. It's Andrew McCarthy. His latest book is called Brat, which is a reference to his years as a young actor. He began acting at 19, um, and he was in movies, in uh, these iconic movies, Pretty in Pink, uh, St. Elmo's Fire, Less Than Zero, and that classic Weekend at Bernie's. We're going to talk to Andrew in just a moment. I'll tell you why. He has directed as well hundreds of television shows, and along the way, he started writing for National Geographic Traveler magazine, where he was uh, a regular for about a dozen years. That led to several books and also numerous articles for other uh, many other publications. But today, I want to talk to him about what he did in August. By the way, if you're watching this after September, uh, the end of September in 2021, we're recording this on uh, September 23rd. It will go live on, well, it will, it will go rec pre-recorded on YouTube and Facebook on September 30th, um, 2021. So keep in mind, if you're watching this a year later or whatever, that we are still wrestling with COVID around the world. Travel is not yet yet returned to normal. All right, that's, that's the, the scene setter. Let me tell you this. When I am tired of sitting in front of my computer, I often take a walk along the Mississippi River, which is just outside my door of my apartment here in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a lovely walk along a paved walk. There's a bicycle path next to me. Uh, if I'm lucky, uh, I'll see a bald eagle along the river in the trees, maybe an osprey on the river's edge. And I'm delighted if I manage 10,000 steps in one day. My guest today, Andrew McCarthy, recently went for a walk as well. But at 10,000 steps, he was only warming up. 40,000 steps was, a, was an average average day for him. His path was the famous Camino de Santiago, a pathway for pilgrims that dates back to the Middle Ages in France and in Spain. Today, some 200,000 people make that walk a year. What technically, if you do the full walk, is a 500-mile walk through Spain and into France, up to the Cathedral of Camino de Santiago, de Santiago in northeastern Spain. Andrew made that walk along with his son, Sam, and I asked him to join today to talk about that very impressive trek. Andrew, Welcome to, welcome to the show, the big show. Nice to have you here. Oh, really good to see you. Well, let's start with the, uh, before we get into the logistics, let's start with how the idea came uh, came to you. When did you uh, have the idea and uh, to do this, uh, to make this huge commitment along with this walk with Sam? Well, that's uh, how long is a piece of string, Rudy, how much you want to hear. I did this walk uh, 25 years ago. I, I walked the Camino myself when I was a much younger man. I read a book. I stumbled on a book called Off the Road by a guy named Jack Hitt, who I always like to plug because Jack changed my life. Um, and I stumbled on his book. I read it, and it was about Jack had to quit his job, left his apartment, and walked the old Camino de Santiago, which I had never heard of at the time. And I, I went. And did, I just I read it, and actually, this is a, a, a little backstory. The very early '90s, the no one, the only one on the internet was Al Gore, and. Uh, so I called up Jack Hitt. His name in the back said he worked at Harper's Magazine. So I called Harper's Magazine and I, because I'd never heard of the Camino. I never met anybody who'd heard of the Camino. I didn't know what it was. So I called him up at Harper's and I said, hey, Jack, um, listen, I read your book. He was like, you read my book? <laughs> you know, he was thrilled. Anyway, so I said, I want to do what you just did. How do you do it? And he just, he sort of told me, he said, you just basically go and you start walking. And there are these yellow arrows that you follow across the entire country. You don't need a map. You don't need anything. You just start walking. So anyway, I went. This intrigued me. I went. And that trip 25 years ago sort of changed the trajectory of my life. Um, in a nutshell, I suppose what it did was illuminated uh fear, how, how, what a dominant factor fear was in my life. And it started my liberation from that, of fear sort of making so, decisions. So you were 58 years old now. This is 25 years ago. So what's, I'm terrible at math. 30s, yeah, like 33 yeah, or something 30, like that. Yeah. Okay. And well, what, so, so I walked yeah. across the thing. What, what, what were you afraid of? It was because you were in the acting world and you never knew whether you were going to get another gig tomorrow? Or? No, I think I just was one of those, you know, I think... People always, you know, when they say, what are you afraid of? I think people just are, uh, have a fearful condition in life. I think I was afraid of people. I was afraid of, you know, I, it was just something that sort of hovered over me and influenced my decisions without my being aware of it, you know. I think people make a lot of bad decisions when they make fearful decisions, you know, and I think we make a lot more fearful decisions than we think. I mean, look at Americans traveling. You know, I think most Americans don't travel. How many of us have passports? Or you know, better not, like 38% or something? At the moment. Half of us have used them, something like that. So... And Americans don't travel internationally, I think, largely because they're afraid. True. 
We've been told the world's this kind of scary place, whatever. So people don't do a lot of things out of fear and they don't. And we kind of convince ourselves that we're being prudent or we're being wise or we're being whatever when really it's fear motivating us. And so I, it was illuminated to me that. So at least when I was making my decisions, I started to learn that fear was the motivating force. And then I could decide whether I wanted to be dominated by that or let fear make my choice or not. Anyway, so I, I walked across Spain. It changed my life. And I always thought I'm going to do that again someday. And I talked about it with my kids, bored them about it endlessly. You know, I said, oh, someday I want to walk. And so recently I just asked my son, Sam, who's 19 years old. And during the pandemic, frankly, a lot of the fear started coming back, you know, and I said, yeah. I need the antidote for fear again. <laughs> so which was that walk. I think it's time I walk. I got 25 years out of the first walk. I think it's time for another one. So I just asked my son, do you want to do, you want to do it with me? And he's like, no. <laughs> and then, uh, then it's, things happened, whatever, in his life. And he just called me up one day and said, Dad, you still want to go across Spain? I'm like, yeah, just, let's go now. Wow. I, so why? The iron is hot. I bought him a plane ticket. I sent him a plane ticket five minutes later and said, we're going next week. Because, uh, you know, he's 19. He's going to change his mind pretty quick about these things. So anyway, and off we went to Spain together. So now it's a 500-mile trek, but I, I gather you can join at many points. Um, did you know where you wanted to start when you got there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to even be longer than 500 miles is where I, I did it from both times in this tank, this town in the south of France called Saint Jean Pied de Port, which, um, excuse yeah. that French accent, uh, which is right at the base of the Pyrenees. And it's sort of a very classic starting point when you start climb over the Pyrenees, enter Spain, and walk the length of Spain. You can start further in France, you know, in Le Puy and in other places. I mean, back in the oldy days when the Camino was first you know, invented, people just walked out their back door, wherever they happen to live, and started walking to Spain. So, but it's, it's, it's St. John has become sort of a, a starting point for people on the trail. And as you said, people do pick it up along the way. Um, but I found the first time I did it, and I knew that this time, one of the rewards, the reward of walking Spain is the sheer length of it and the monotony and the physical wearing you down and which wears down the emotional kind of stuff too. But a lot of people, you can start a hundred kilometers from Santiago and still get what they call a Compostela, which is proof that you've walked the trail and you have walked the Camino. And a lot of, most people do that. They walk for like five days and they walk the Camino. To me, that would be misery because the first five days are hard and you're just getting blisters and you, you know, the, the reward of it is in the sheer length of it and, physical exertion over time you know so, like you said a lot of people start various points most start very close to the end and just walk for a week because that's all they have time for or that's all they're interested in took you basically the month of august right yeah i started in late july it was 31 days of walking we started i think the 29th of july and got in like the 28th of august and what sort of i mean i've i've, I've I do remember talking to someone who did the walk and they talked about the number of pairs of shoes they went through i mean what <laughs> what did you have to I mean, did you make it all in one pair of shoes? I did, yeah. Um, you need so little. I'll tell you what to do, but you need so little. I did make it in one pair of shoes. The first time I went, I was uh, utterly unprepared, and I wore a big pair of leather hiking boots that I brought on the way to the airport. I mean, I knew nothing. And, you know, I had vicious blisters and, you know, was at, threw, the, threw them in a river and bought a pair of sneakers and walked Spain in a pair of sneakers. This time I had some little day hikers that um, – day runners you know and just and was fine uh i did actually halfway through i started to get some blisters again and sought out other shoes but i kept what i had but yeah i mean what you need to walk across bay Rudy, is a pair of shorts a t-shirt a pair of longer pants and a sweatshirt maybe for the evening and a pair of flip-flops and some sun and some sun's protection i think and some sun protection a hat and you know and a toothbrush and uh, a sleeping bag. And that is all you need. Everyone brings too much. Along the way, you constantly see people all along the side of the road. Shirts left behind, shoes, bags. I mean, you see people just shedding stuff as they go. They realize emotionally, metaphorically, and literally, they don't need all this crap. Well, in August, you said it was 99 degrees at times. I mean, that's really, really hot. But where do you, you said you took a sleeping bag, but aren't there sort of guest houses or air yeah how it works is how do, you, do you have to plan ahead for these things where do you sleep where do you eat yeah i mean so 
back when, you know, we should back up a tiny bit and like give a tiny bit of context. So in the eighth century, the Catholic Church said the bones of St. James have been discovered in the far western reach of Spain, and anyone who marches there gets half their time in purgatory knocked off. This also <laughs> happened to coincide with the Moors taking over Spain, and they, they and the church said, by the way, as you're walking over there, kick those damn Moors out. And so it was the beginning of the Crusades and the Knights Templar, and it was really about this, the Christian reconquest of Spain was why the bones of St. James happened to be found in the farther. <laughs> so there's some dispute whether those bones were actually there, because how did the apostles' bones get to the farther most corner of Spain? But anyway, so the, the Catholic Church said this to the faithful. The faithful started walking across Spain, and about a day's walk, in between, these villages sprung up to service these pilgrims and house them and in those things feed them. So now there are about a day's walk from each other, all these little villages along the way that you stop at and they and an infrastructure has you know grown up where you can say in refugios or albergues as they call them, and which is like basically a pilgrim hostel, youth hostel, you know, bunk beds, and you can sleep there and for a few euro a night and all the other pilgrims who are traveling from all other around the world. It's a great way to meet people and you're doing one thing there. You can also stay in small pensiones or little guest houses, which um, we did as well. And this year with COVID, uh, about half of the uh, albergues were closed and they were only operating at 50% capacity. So sometimes you needed to do that anyway. And me being 58 years old, I thought, you know what? I can have my own bathroom in my own bedroom. I'm, I'm not sleeping with all these sweaty uh, pilgrims snoring. So uh, just as often, we just sort of sought out our own little accommodation each evening. So, so it's easy to find any book. I would book like a day or two in advance. But you can how, also. How would you, know how, how would you know how to book? Is there a sheet, something online where it tells there you? There is. There's so much infrastructure. Like, you know, the first time I did it, there was nothing. There's a place called the Confraternity of St. James, which is an English um, group that is associated with people walking the Camino. And I found out about them, I can't remember how now, years ago. And they were the only, and they sent me a little pamphlet, you 25 years ago, a little stapled together pamphlet about how to, what to do and where to stay. This time, there's so much on the internet. There's so much out there. There was one website called Grons, G-R-O-N-Z-E dot com, I think. And it listed all the hotels and albergues in the next town along the way. And there's so much. You spend five minutes on the internet now. You can find, you know, people have videoed their walks and, you know, they'll tell you how to pack. They'll tell you, you know, there's all this stuff online. As I was planning to go this time, I started to look at stuff and I realized you just, you don't need to look at it. <laughs> you just need your backpack, your pair of sneakers, your shorts, your toothbrush, and, you know, some willingness and off you go. Um, and it's all, it presents itself very cleanly and very simply. You know, it's the beauty of it is there's no organization in any way, except there are all these people doing this common thing and this great solidarity sort of grows up amongst these people. You know, you travel, you know, we, me and my son traveled alone. You know, we walked alone with each other each day, but you see people day in and day out along the trail if you're on the similar cycle. You know, if you stop and rest for three days, you'll be with a whole new pot of people that are walking through. You know, um, but we, you know, met the same people. And so we'd have dinner with a similar people, a group of like eight to 10 of us would often gather in, in the town square. All unofficially, we just sort of would all sort of find each other, congregate for dinner. And But it wasn't, it wasn't crowded though. This year was not crowded. No, it's when I did it, it was about like it was when I did it 25 years ago. Well, it's probably more crowded this year, but they're, they're operating about, a third capacity uh, for the Camino, of what it usually is, I was told. Is that because um, they're controlling it or just because? No, no, they're not controlled, just because of COVID. Just because of COVID, people staying home. And for, I mean, frankly, it's the perfect COVID, act, COVID activity because you're outside all day long. Perfect. You're, you know, it, it, you're in the middle of nowhere. It's, you know. So you did 500 miles, 40K steps. You often walk 15 to 20 miles a day. You yeah. said on, uh, uh, by the way, if you would like to see the, f the photos, we're sh so this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. That's part of what it looks like, yeah. That's one of the more uninteresting parts, but yeah. yeah but no, I mean, but did it ever rain? Did it get muddy? It only rained on the second day when we were up in the Pyrenees, it rained. But in August, you know, it doesn't rain much in Spain. Yeah. Um, it only rained on its one day. Okay. Um, so, but what, uh, let me tell the uh, folks who are watching, if you would like to see almost a day-by-day -day account of, of uh, Andrew and Sam's walk, uh, go to Andrew McCarthy on uh, Instagram. And almost every day he, he posted a picture. And I do post every day. You know, I didn't plan to, but then people sort of, you know, then I just started to and just sort of. Yeah, no, it was great. Well, what I, what I like, the, uh, the, the nice twist you had 
is that you talked about what you talked about with Sam that day. You talked about uh, Kanye, rage, uh, high fashion, Shakespeare, marijuana, fame, keto diets, Coke in a bottle versus a can, peanut M&Ms versus plain. Apparently you'd like plain. A dating oh, peanut, peanut. I'm all about the peanut, Rudy. <laughs> oh, you like the peanut. I'm sorry. A uh, hobbits, tattoos, skydiving. So in, in Andrew's very short Instagram posts, say, you know, we're a day so-and-so. We walked this many miles today or this many steps. And this is what we talked about, which was really interesting. I saw no sign in your Instagram posts of any um, conflict with Sam or Sam's conflict with you. <laughs> We're a father and son. There was conflict every day. The mostly the conflict was and existed was Sam, get the f out of bed. We gotta go. <laughs> that was our conflict every morning. Once we got out of out the door, we were great. Um, but every morning there was get out of bed because Sam would sleep. And you can't in Spain in August walk in two p.m. heat. It's just scorching. And so you want to be where you're going by then. And we, you know, so that was our daily battle was getting on the road. But what time, what time did you like to get on the road? I mean, I would if I were alone, I would have gotten on the road at 6 37 in the morning. Most pilgrims are very early because it's beautiful dawn walking. Beautiful. And you know, you're there where you're going six, seven hours later. So you're there early afternoon, you go in, you sort of find where you're staying, you take a nap, <laughs> you know, you put your feet up, put your put, rub your cream on your feet, get a bite to eat, and suddenly it's sort of dinner time, you're meeting with people. So your afternoons are sort of recovering and at leisure and exploring whatever town you happen to be in. So how many hours did you actually walk to get in 40,000 steps a day? You know, you're walking six, seven, eight hours. Mm -hmm. With a lunch break? Well, I mean, yeah, you'd stop at a little, little village, you'd either have some stuff, grab some stuff, we'd go off and grab, you know, packets of Serrano ham, you know, and um, or Hamoni Birico when we're in a big, nice big city and get the fancy stuff, and you know, and sit by the side of the trail and just eat the ham. And you know, and that, those are some of our best lunches. Or if you're passive, you know, all these towns have little bars, meaning cafes, and you know, you get a get what you know, basic, simple food along the way. Now, this was not your first trip to find yourself. Obviously, you did it when you were in uh, 33. But also, um, after you were divorced, you had, a, you had Sam, your son. Uh, you were about to marry uh, uh, your second wife, to whom you're married now, I gather, and, uh, and you have a daughter. Um, before you married, you were, you were betwixt and between, if I can generalize. You wound up writing a book called The Longest Way Home, um, and you just decided, you told your Fiance, you needed, well, there's a subtitle, One Man's Quest for the Courage to Settle Down. You decided you had to hit the road to get to know yourself better or to be sure of what you were doing. And you didn't just hit the road. You went to Patagonia, you went to Tanzania, you went to Costa Rica. I mean, how long was that journey? And, and, and what, if you had to sum it up today, why did you make that journey? Well, in fairness, that, that those journeys were um, there were I think there's six or seven in the in the book that I was actively very much engaged in travel writing a lot at those times. So I was on assignment for various magazines to go to these places, and it, it really it, it was yes, I was getting married, and I was perfectly happy to be getting married and excited to be getting married. But what I was wrestling with, and what I've wrestled with my whole life is, and this that journey helped illuminate that, which I'll get to was. How do we reconcile our need to be alone and singular and who and have close sort of intimacy and communion with another person? And they seem completely incompatible. And you know, I think the answer is that, you know, they are utterly incompatible and we do it anyway. Um, and so it was me wrestling with this idea of how do I, you know, stay because I have found myself while I'm on the road. You know, the further from home I am, often the closer to myself I feel. And I've discovered who I am, the, you know. I was a terrible student in school. The road has sort of been, traveling has been my university. You know, I've learned so much about who I am and how I fit in the world and how I feel about things while I'm traveling. And so that's why I sort of stumbled into travel writing. It's why I keep traveling. It really illuminates who I am to myself. And I think, you know, I am, like people often say, the better version of myself when I'm on the road. I think a lot of people feel that way. Is it fair to say you're walking the Camino de Santiago? was about father and son as opposed to religious reasons. Oh, it was absolutely, it was secular completely. It was, it was, it was because my son is 19 years old. He's sort of embarking, he's starting his life 
you know, my relationship with my dad kind of ended by the time when I was about 19. I left and that was really, our relationship was just basically over. I would like to, I, I've been actively wanting to figure out and do how do we transition into an adult relationship where I'm not parenting you hard, like get out of bed, Sam. And how do we communicate on an adult sort of mature level? I am, you know, my, if my goal as a parent, I think, is that kind of go, go. I'm right here behind you. I would like to be like a backstop in baseball. I'm right here behind you. You turn around and look, I'm right here. Go out into the world and I'll be right here waiting. Or if you need me, I'm right here. And to feel like there's that kind of support behind. And I thought if my if I can have that relationship with my adult children, then my life as a parent will have been a success, you know? And so like I said, I had no, my parent relationship, my dad vanished at that age to never be sort of rekindled. And so as my son is transitioning to his own, own adult life, I wanted to go, some, we're going to do this together and let's figure out how we be two grown people walking across this, you know, and Sam starts to have insights that I wouldn't have. And, you know, that's why I love talking. You know, one of the beauties of it was we had the time, you know, usually when you get your sense like, okay, so what's going on? You know, you got 10 minutes in the garden, they're out the door, you know, and I knew we had the time, you know, and my son is such that, um, it's difficult to get him to sit down and have a chat, but you get my son moving physically and he'll start talking. And so I thought the Camino was the perfect way. We just start walking and he starts talking and to sort of start musing the way you do when you walk and then something comes up and we're just getting to know each other on a man to man kind of way, you know, and that has, you know, to, to me, it was a, I'm going to start crying. It was a beautiful thing. You know, oh, I am, I am uh, tearing up here a little. Um, so it was a great success. I mean, it's, it's one, it was a powerful, beautiful experience. Yes, I was thinking of arousing success. And I, you know, I, I, it was to me a beautiful experience. I mean, I think Sam was equally had a, you know, at the beginning, he was like day two, he was like, Dad, what is the point of this? And by, you know, and, see, and it, wasn't, it wasn't being facetious. And he asked, you know, and on the third day, he went to Pamplona, which is one of the several sort of wonderful cities you come to along the way in northern Spain and where they do the running of bulls. And, uh, he, as we're walking in, I got a little insight into his like, dad. Is there an airport in Pamplona? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Uh, but, Exit strategy already, huh? Yeah. And, well, but, you know, by the end, he said, um, as we came home, he said, that doing this, the Camino is the only 10 out of 10 thing I've ever done in my life. Wow. So, I mean, I, and, wow. you know, that's a beautiful thing for me to hear, you know? It is. So when, when he first said to you in the second day, what's this? Why are we doing this? Did you say, oh, well, son, it's so, you know, you and I can get to know each other better. And it's I mean, did you give him that platitude or? Oh, I talked to him, you know, as I'm parenting him hard at home about pick up, pick that up. Don't leave it for us to pick up. You know, I said, Sam, I would like our relationship to evolve beyond this and to be have mature no relationship. So, yeah, yes. I mean, that was sort of. I guess did we discuss it? Sure, we discussed everything. We discussed my divorce from his mother and what that made him feel. You know, things we'd never really discussed before. You know, and you know the beauty of that again was that there was time to just not have a conversation. There was time to sort of the way one does talk about something, sit with it, digest it. Next day, come back to it a little bit. Go, you know, but it did make me think that you know, in the way we do when we have a discussion with someone about important stuff and silly stuff like Coca-Cola and things like that, but important stuff where it, it digests and then the next day you circle back and go, I had another thought on that and that kind of stuff. And, and having the walk in common, walking is a powerful thing, as you know, and the rhythm of walking uh, and walking together with someone, that rhythm, you know, what's that great Greek on, you know, it is solved by walking and all the great philosophers always talk about the import of walking and how our brain works at a walking level. and you know, and the sheer physical wearing down, both on a metaphorical and a literal way of like, the defenses fall and you're just, you're, as I kept saying to Sam so many times, Sam, people just get tired and are gonna be who they are. Be able to put on their whatever for a little bit, but sooner, sooner rather than later, they're just gonna be tired and be who they are. <laughs> and so. That's so very well put. My guest, by the way, I should, I see your last name is not on the picture there. My guest is the actor, director and writer, Andrew McCarthy who this August of 2021 uh, spent about a month, almost all of August, a little July, all of August, walking the, uh, the famous pilgrimage route that starts in France and ends in Spain. I still have tears in my eyes. I have a son, you know, and you're right. He lives in San Francisco. I'm in the wrong, you know, when I see him in San Francisco, I have like dinner with him, you know, and I want to get everything and I rarely, rarely do. So I really, 
appreciate what you did. Uh, Andrew McCarthy's talking about that walk and the Camino de Santiago. If you go to his uh, Instagram page, you can uh, you can see some of the pictures, uh, a lot of the pictures of the walk and what they talked about and so on. How old is your daughter? My daughter is 15 and I have a seven year old son as well. Ah, OK, so. Uh, well, you're, you can you, you got enough years and you can take each of them out on, on a long walk, can't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I didn't go, Dad. <laughs> my daughter would like if there's not a mall every you know in every little town, she's not going. Oh, okay. <laughs> my seven year old said he'd go with me, so I'm like, Geez, I hope I'm okay in ten years to go. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> sixty two, right? Um, but I presume you saw some some old dogs like me out there. Um, they were all shapes and sizes, you know, a little slower. That's all. All shapes and sizes out there. And, you know, there were a lot of older people, the closer we got that started later, you know, mm -hmm. frankly, they weren't walking the full, you know, 30 odd days, but, you know, walking 10 days a week and stuff. And there were groups. I saw people, older walkers in the group because there are a lot of, um, there are tour companies that do it in groups. So, so people feel more supported and stuff. And, uh, you know, we carried our backpacks and everything with us every day, which, you know, they were light. They were like 15, 20 pounds, but we still carried them all the day. There are like services there that they'll taxi your backpack to the next place. So you just carry your water bottle. I mean, there's, there's grown up there. People have figured out how to wait and make money, you know, mm -hmm. off this. Because this really, the, the Camino revitalized the portion of Spain that it was dead. You know, when I walked it 25 years ago, these little villages were dying. It was just widows dressed in black sweeping out there front to there were no young people there were no you know it was a very dying part of spain this rural part and the camino has, has gained such success over the last two decades that a lot of these towns have become revitalized again to service um the pilgrims walking through so uh you know the community, so yeah well, well, you know you said you got blisters i mean you put that in your instagram you just mentioned it while we've been talking i mean a blister doesn't heal in one day by putting some cream on it before you go to bed i mean well, no, there is this cream in Spain. <laughs> that, 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 I think it would be prescription. The Camino, the Camino uh, cream? <laughs> it's this ibuprofen cream anyway. But um, I only got blisters when we started walking across the Meseta. There's a place called the Meseta about halfway through, which is the High Plains. And that is just, it's flat and it's about four or five days of just wheat fields. And it is as far as the eye can see, it's wheat. And you walk to the end of the rise, you come to the horizon, and as far as you can see, there's another field of wheat. And it drives people, and it, it's hot. That's where it was like 100 degrees. And there's a hot wind blowing all the time. And people kind of lose their mind at that, you know, often. And I remember on the first time I walked, you know, that I had a breakdown sobbing in this field of wheat of just like, I was just like, get me out of here. And I was just sobbing, screaming up at the heavens. You know, this and Sam and I had a vicious fight in the middle of the, of the, the Meseta it, over nothing. I don't even remember what it was about, but we just got into it. He stormed off and like, I didn't see him until that night. You know, it, it's, um, well, you said at one point he came over here and said, oh, look, dad, another shade of brown. Yeah, I mean, that was part of the Meseta, too. And anyway, it was so hot there that my feet were sweating a lot. So I started in the middle of the journey. I started to get some blisters. And yeah, for a couple of days, it was really bad. But, you know, you get a lot of compete and you kind of realize, you know, man up, you know. You get a lot of what? There's a this thing called Compede, which is like Band-Aids that have healing agents in them. Um, and they sell them at every drugstore, every pharmacy in Spain. The first place, the first thing you walk in, there's a big tower of Compede, you know, so... Um, you know, it, uh, but yeah, I mean, you also realize you're a lot stronger than you think. You know, one of the most profound things is always you find the first thing you would see as you walk, as you're walking and there's nothing and there's nothing, is you'll see the spire of a, of a the church in this Pacific town, because that's the first thing you can see, of course, the spire. And then the town will start to emerge. And so you just, at certain points in the afternoon, you're, so, you're just tired and you just, where is that spire of whatever town you're coming into? And you'd see it and you go, okay. It's another six kilometers, four kilometers to that town. And that's still another hour's worth of walking. But whereas um, if I were walking in New York, I'd be like, an hour of walking? Are you kidding me? Right, right. Whereas there, it's just like, okay, there it is. You know, and it was a real valuable lesson. I so remember clearly, you know, when I was a younger man when I did it first, I was always sort of of the mind to sort of toss me the ball on the five yard line, I'll score the touchdown. <laughs> and this, the walking and the realizing there's this spire. It's another six kilometers. It's an hour and 20 minutes. I have no one's picking me up to get there. I have to get it really helped me learn to finish a task 
and to burn it step by step by literally step by step. And it really solidified a sense of myself in, if that makes any kind of sense, and that I've carried with me these, and I didn't realize that until I was walking again this time when I saw that spire the first when we started walking, I'm like, oh, it's a spire, of course. And the feeling of, okay, muscle this home, you know, and, and it's just, you know, there's a sense of growth and solidity in self that I lacked when I was younger that I think the Camino helped me establish. And I think that was wonderful for my son too, who tends to be a bit flighty of being able to go, no, there's no way to get there except one step at a time, march. Straight Put on your Kanye and, you know, march there. Is there, are there mileage signs along the way? No, there are, um, no, that's not true. There are often, now there are a lot of signposts, little, you know, community, 864 kilometers to Santiago, you know. So yes, there are, yes. He's, and But mostly you're just following painted little yellow arrows that are on trees, on rocks, on, on the road. And But there are signposts now as it's gotten more successful, sort of that prop up, you know, Santiago, 412 kilometers. But then you also go, the next signpost, it goes Santiago, 482 kilometers. You're like, what is it? Four, you know what I mean? So. And you were tracking your steps and mileage, I gather, with probably with a phone, right? Well, I mean, you know, at the beginning, we were, very, you know, yes, we were, had them on our phone. They're just naturally good. By the end, you realize you, we didn't even look at it. First day, we were like, how many steps have we done so far? 22,000. Okay, we got another 18 to go, you know, but by the end, you, you don't even bother. Well, there's the, there's the big question. Do you have cell phone coverage all along the way? More or less. Really? More or less. You know, you do. Right. I mean, worlds connect. You know, that's, of course, one of the things that you wrestle with is like, do you want to be that connected when you're doing that? Sure. You know, um, and you naturally find yourself looking less and less. Even my son found himself le less looking less and less at TikTok every day, you know, and because it's just not. It's one of these things. It's very immediate and very simple and very intense. And it really takes your attention. All you're doing is getting up, putting on your shoes, making sure you got everything and walking to the next place. And it, it fully occupy you think you'll have a lot of time for all this other kind of you know and i guess you do but in, in a certain way it's it fully engages what you're doing and because the physical demand is fairly strenuous um you're, you're fully occupied you know it's never there are moments when it's like boring but in a, in a way of just like next keep going you know <laughs> inexorable sort of there's an inexorable feeling of gathering too as you get closer that is undeniable it's really it's satisfying. Like Sam said at one point, he goes, this isn't fun, but it's really satisfying. Interesting. You know? How did you celebrate when you reached uh, when, you, when you reached touchdown? You know, as always these things, I mean, we just hugged and I, of course, cried. <laughs> um, but these things are always invariably anticlimactic. You know, the, luckily the cathedral is so beautiful when you first arrive and you stand up and you're still just buzzing. And you, Sam turned to me and you just, you know, there are certain things that a pilgrim normally does, you know. So Tommy, um, excuse me, I was just saying, Tommy, do you have a picture of the cathedral there? I, I think I sent it to you last night. I'm not sure. It's that great big cathedral. Uh, and I think Andrew and his son are standing in front of it. Anyway, well, let's see if Tommy has it. He can put it up. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, but did you have a huge dinner? I mean, did you? Well, well, well we did have dinner with a bunch of the other folks that we'd walked with. Oh, ah, good. But, you know, there's certain things that the pilgrim is supposed to do, you know, if you're a pilgrim or just a walker. You know, that's another distinction we talk about. But, uh you know, you go into the church and you hug the saint and thank him. For, there's a statue of Santiago and you hug St. James and thank him for your for looking after you on the tour. And there's a thing on the wall that you touch, you know, again, to thank the saint for sort of looking after you. And along the way, there are people that will say, you know, un abrazo por Santiago, a, a hug for the saint, which means when you get there, hug the saint, you know, as a prayer for these people. Um, but because of COVID, you weren't allowed to do any of that. We weren't allowed to do any of that. There's several rituals. So there was a sort of feeling of, <laughs> but then Sam kind of turned to me as I was feeling frustrated that we're not getting the reward like I did last time. I remember it so clearly hugging the saint and having that be a very moving experience. And Sam said, dad, this is what, this one was really about the journey, not the destination. <laughs> I'm like, it's totally right. You know, it was just, so there's a feeling of, you know, and I've watched, as you watch people come in, to the square, I hung around in Santiago for a couple of days after, and you watch people come in and they're excited and thrilled, and then they hug and they they just sort of don't know what to do with themselves, you know. And they look up, they take pictures, and pictures are somehow inadequate. They cry, they just sort of really the most satisfying thing is they just sit down on their backpack and they just sort of stare off that hundred mile stare that walkers have and just go, I did it, 
And how, do you get, how do you get out of town? Is there an airport there? How do you? How do you? There's an airport in, outside Santiago. Yeah, and you can fly out from there. And you're back in your life in a day, and you're like, "Whoa, that was what I wish I was walking." You know? Yeah. How often did you and your son talk to family on the phone? I talked to we talk every day. You know, we'd Skype with my daughter and my wife or, or FaceTime. You know, every pretty much every day. You know, just because my, my little guy, you know, they were tracking us on a map, tracking us walking across, you know, so he would be seeing where we are and that kind of thing. Um, so we were in contact a lot. You know, I think some people do and they go completely out of contact. Um, but like I remember when I first did it, I made a few calls on a pay phone, collect calls. But this is 25 years ago. You know what I mean? And so I was gone. Whereas this time, you know, you... You can actively do that, but in a certain way, it falls away in a natural way that's nice. And then there are certain things you sort of feel obliged to do, and you you do them along the way. Is there a book coming? Another one as well? There, well, is that, there there is a book coming about this. Yes. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah, and uh, I just have the people ask me about it. in a nutshell. I always just say with the Camino, it's just, it's a weird thing because you. You eat bad food, you sleep in bad beds, you walk over a country that a lot of it's not that beautiful, your, your bones literally ache, and yet somehow by the end of it, you've had the most extraordinary experience and go, I'm gonna do that again, you know? <laughs> did you know you were gonna write a book before you started your walk? Yes. So did you take a lot of notes? That's, I mean, at the end of one of those days, uh, I mean, even in more, more journalist friendly territory. I always swear, okay, at the end of the day, when I get back to my hotel room, I'm going to write all the notes about today and everything. And I never, I'm just too tired. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and, and I said exactly that and was exactly not too tired. Um, <laughs> when I, um, I have all those little, those little Moleskine notebooks and I was writing as I walked them, my writing was so bad as I'm walking, you know, right, right, right. And I will often try and go through before why I still remember to sort of cross that out and write legibly so that I could actually read it. Um, but I didn't read all my notes until I came home and I realized, Jesus, I don't have any notes here. All I say is it's hot, wheat fields, <laughs> you know? 22 miles, 45 feet. You, uh, but uh, it was interesting about the, just to leave it, that the, the, knowing I was going to do a book in a certain way, I had my brain operating with a certain level of anxiety that I um, <laughs> wish I didn't have, frankly. Right, right, right. You didn't take a laptop then? Or, or, no, I thought to. I thought I would, might because I would then do then each evening I'd write up my notes for an hour, but I did not take a laptop at the end of it because I thought I should just, you know, like whenever I'm in the field writing a story, I don't, well, I do do that, but I don't really, I do take a note, but I you always just write in those little moleskin pads and that's always been fine. But, you know, I hadn't done this big, I filled 10 pads. So, I mean, uh, you the know, photographs are going to help. But, and a lot of these things are, you know, the Camino is a slow burn. You know, like the walk itself, it's incremental. It's step by step. You know, you can't come back and figure out what you thought about it. You know what I mean? It takes a second to sort of, what was that? Right. You know, so that's my excuse anyway for not starting writing yet. <laughs> Gee, I've never had that feeling that I didn't want to start writing. Uh, <laughs> well, welcome home, uh, Andrew McCarthy. And, and thanks for hanging out with us for uh, 45 minutes or so. Andrew McCarthy, uh, director, actor. and what are, you what are you directing these days, by the way? I am doing a show called The Blacklist right now. Oh, of course. That's still airing. I'm sorry I didn't mean it that way, but it's been on for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's still churning on. Like the Camino, it's just endless. <laughs> well, one long slog. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and Ricardo, you can, uh, you, can, you can read about his books. Uh, I would recommend uh, uh, all of them. Although I haven't read Brad. I'm looking forward to reading that. That's his latest book about his Brat Pack days as a, as a young man. Didn't take any notes then, but he managed to write a book. So I think he can do this one uh, uh, by going to andrewmccarthy.com. Very simple, andrewmccarthy.com. I followed him on his walk uh, on Instagram and was just blown away by the whole thing. And and uh, as a father of a, a grown son, I envied what he was doing. So now I'm going to start crying again. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thanks, Rudy. Always a pleasure to talk to you and see you. Good luck writing the book. Thanks. I'll need it. Call me if you want to waste time and not write. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for joining us today. Keep in mind that this was recorded on September 23rd of 2021. Uh, we're going to post it on YouTube uh, during my because it's an every two week thing on September 30 Thursday, September 30th, 2021. So again, I really, you know, as an old journalist, uh, newspaper guy at the Washington Post, you know, you wrote it, it was out the next day, and then it disappeared. 
So this is a this is a whole new thing where you do something like this, and then it's up on YouTube for I don't know beyond my lifetime. Yeah, my, I don't know how long I keep these things up on YouTube after you pass away. But uh, I, I think it's important you know when we do that when we tape this, which is 2021, and uh, keep that in mind as you listen. So again, thanks. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Appreciate you. my thanks to Andrew and Tommy Danielson for uh, producing the segment. See you again. Meanwhile, travel safely.